form, so thank you very much. And it's just been wonderful to be away with my best friend for the last five weeks. So yes, we while you've been freezing in the sun, we've had a chance to uh, freezing in the in the cold. We've had a chance to be in the sun. It's been wonderful. But it's really good to be back. I was in Nurok Mall yesterday. I saw coffee advertised for six rand ninety nine. You know how cheap that is. That is for nothing. Six rand ninety nine. I'm telling you. I don't even want to tell you what it costs in Switzerland to have a cup of coffee. You will all just fall over. Anyway, so it's really good to be back. And um, so Mike uh, asked me if I would preach before I went away at the time. It sounded like a good idea. And he asked me to preach on church uniting. And so now I'm not too sure if it was such a good idea. But anyway, we're going to give it a bash. And I want to just preach this morning. I want to share the word from Psalm 133. So if you have your Bibles and you want to read along, it's just three verses. It's a Psalm of David, and I'm going to use this text just to share the Word of God. So Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life evermore. Isn't that beautiful? We only had five sheets of paper left in our printer. And when, after I printed this, I realized, my gosh, I can, don't know if I can even read this these days. It's looking quite small. So if I can't read it, I'm just going to throw away the notes and do my best. Um. I was, we had a really good time and, and we, we spent a little bit of time with probably my best mate, a guy who I ran the comrades with, a guy by the name of Luigi Zuccarelli and we met up again in Italy and while we were having a coffee, he, he said this to me and, and, I, and instantly because of what I was preaching on, it kind of registered. He said, you know, I don't believe there's any unity in the church and he said, and I doubt there ever will be. Wow. I don't know if he's wrong. But that was quite a statement to make. I don't know if there's any unity in the church. I don't think there's any unity in the church. But I tell you what, I believe and I'm convinced that unity is God's plan for us. Both in the church, in our relationships, in our family. That is what God has designed He's designed us to be in unity together. And so much so that God says, I'm even going to send a blessing with unity. So it's like a package deal. He has packaged it together with a blessing that is just a consequence of being in unity. So God places a very high value and he's a generous God. And when he blesses, he really blesses. But one thing I've really come to understand in recent times is that whenever God tries to do something, the devil tries to undo it. And so where God wants to bring a blessing, Satan will always want to come and do the opposite. Bring a curse. Bring trouble. Bring division. Because that's his job. He doesn't want anything that God's any of God's plans to succeed. And so Satan will attack marriage. He will attack families. He will attack churches to sow division so that we do not enjoy unity so that the blessing of God cannot flow. And you know, this really came to me. We were lying on the beach a few weeks ago. Man, it was beautiful. Although, I must tell you, those Italian beaches or wherever we were, they're all rocks. Have you ever laid on rocks and stones? They don't have sand there. I'm telling you, this is a, a pleasure to go down to this beach. So we are lying on these rocks, although they're not that uncomfortable actually. And the sun was just beautiful and warm. And you know what it's like when you're lying there and it's just perfect. It wasn't too hot. It, the sun was warming us. 
And the next thing, there was this one little cloud in the sky and it came across the sun. It was a wispy little thing. But it was enough to take the heat right out of the sun. And I thought, oh, actually God said to me, you know what? He said, this is exactly what Satan does. We are trying to just be in the presence, in the warmth of God, and Satan will come and put something in the way. Something as small as a little wispy little cloud could take away all the heat of the sun. And we lay there, and I kept saying to them, man, oh, this cloud is irritating me. And then I'd say, but don't worry, honey, I'm telling you in a minute it's, it's going to be gone. And then the sun would pop out the side again and, oh, beautiful. This is what we have for man. And then this cloud would swirl back again. And you know, it was so annoying. And, and it was like the Lord was saying, but that's what Satan does. He, he, he will bring dissension. He will bring disagreement. He will bring an argument. He will bring judgment. He will do anything to just put a cloud in the way of the warmth of God in our lives. Because our job is to just luxuriate in the radiance of the Son of God. Let Jesus' light just shine in our lives. But you know, Satan doesn't want that. And so when you analyze it, he will bring these disruptions. The good thing was that when I looked a few minutes later, that cloud had burnt away. And I'm telling you, if you just stay where you should be, the sun always wins. In order to understand unity, I want to start off by looking at what unity is not. Because I think we often have this skewed perception of what unity really is. Some people think that if we all just get along, we will have unity. That's not unity. You know, you can get along just fine, but you may be sitting there, even though you're getting along, but you really have different plans, different visions, different ideas. And so just getting along together, so long as there's no trouble in the church, oh, then we'll have unity. That's not unity. Sometimes we say, well, if we just all agree. So if you have a different opinion, let's just all agree to agree. Then we will have unity because, you know, we'll just lay aside our own ideas and whatever. That's not unity. That's just agreement. If we just have cohesion, let me tell you that the presence of cohesion is not enough to say, well, that's unity. Not even thinking the same thing, I believe, is unity. And not even just choosing to love one another. You know, that oak in the third row, he's, oh, we just don't get along, but I'm just going to choose to love him. No, no, no disrespect to anyone in the third row. <laughs> I just slipped out. Listen, none of these are bad because there's been times and you know, you, you know what it's like when you, you say something from the pulpit and afterwards someone always has to come and say, you know, what you said, what you should have really said was this. So don't misquote me. None of these are bad. These are good things. Agreeing together, loving one another, having cohesion. These are great things. But that is not necessarily a sign of unity. We need to be aware of what unity is then. So if that's not unity, what is it? Well, I believe that whenever you want to explain something, the, the perfect example is always Jesus. If you look to see what Jesus did, you can't really go wrong. And you know, at one stage, Lynn's dad had organized this villa in Burgundy, and he brought the whole family there, and we all just spent a week. And we were like in this villa, and the whole of Burgundy is just vineyards. And so in the morning, the very first morning, I got up and I'd walk past the vineyards, and it was just amazing. It was wonderful. 
And as I was walking past the vineyards, the Lord spoke to me and he said, I'm going to give you a picture of unity. And I just remembered that Jesus said, I am the true vine. And as I was looking at all these vineyards and I was inspecting the little bushes and the little trees, I remembered Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser, or some, some versions say the husbandman. The vine dresser is a laborer who looks after the vineyards. I'll get to that in a minute. And Jesus said that if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Okay, so we're getting, I'm the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Abide in me and you will have or bear much fruit. So that's what Jesus was saying. He said, for a part, this is in John 15, abide in me and I in you. For apart from me, you can do nothing. But you know, it was interesting to, that Jesus then went on. In John 5 verse 19, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Isn't that amazing that Jesus was saying, I, I can't do anything on my own. I just do what the Father does. Because he said, I and the Father are one. That's amazing. And Jesus is saying that we can't do anything on our own outside of him. And right there is the secret, I believe, of unity. Abiding in the vine it's a little bit like sun tanning on the beach, just remaining in the vine where the warmth of that sun reaches you. I believe that only that true unity can only come in Christ. You see, you can experience a taste of the flavor of unity. When a family pulls together, maybe sometimes you have a crisis in the family and the family pulls together or you're in a team and you're losing one at half time and you come together and you, can you have this team talk. Come on, guys, we've got to pull together. We've got to fight for one another. Come on, we've got each other's back. You know those kind of team talks? Yeah, that's good. That's good. But that's just a flavor. It's a taste of unity. That's not truly <coughs> unity. The problem is that our sinful nature is so strong and our personal ambition always comes into play. And that's the problem. It's our sinful nature. It's our selfishness. And these are the things that Satan uses to bring that cloud. Sometimes you say, well, you know, I like to be really humble and, 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 and not very selfish. You know, man, we had a bad experience flying back. I'm not going to, maybe I will mention the airline. But anyway, it doesn't matter. We were like, our flight was canceled. Okay, but not well before the time. First we had to check in, go through passport control. Then they scan you and then my knee always goes off on those machines. So then they pat you down, they half strip you naked, they check your shoes, they... You know, you know, this is, then they unpack everything in your bag. You start to feel like you've done something really bad. And, and by the time you finish, you're now packing your bags again. Then you have to catch a train from when you, then you go through passport control. Then you catch this train to the other terminal. Then it's three escalators, two flights of stairs, all the way to the gate. And when you got to the gate, they said your flight is canceled. <laughs> go figure. Your flight is canceled. But don't worry, we will give you a free hotel room and free transport. And so now if you go to the other terminal, go to this desk, then you stand in this long queue and eventually, anyway, cut a long story short, we have to catch this free shuttle to the hotel. That's a whole plane load of people. Twelve people can fit in the shuttle. And it comes around every 30 minutes. So the first time we kind of go up to the shuttle and everybody's like crowding in. And of good South Africans, we just stand back. Well, we're not going to be selfish, you know. Okay, so we missed that bus. And then you miss the next bus. Now you start to scheme. Hold on a minute. If we're just polite, 
we're going to be here till 2 o'clock in the morning. And you know what happens? Thanks, Rose. You know what happens? Your selfish nature then kicks in. And we said, listen, nobody beats us to the next shuttle. And we were on the next shuttle. Sometimes we, we just want to be heard. We want to be taken seriously. We want our voice to be heard. We want to know that what we do is important in the church. We want to make sure that our opinions count. And none of this is bad, but you know, it's only when we surrender our own interests and we become completely selfless that we can really experience true unity. And that does not come without submission to Jesus. It's like, you know, if you were preparing a big orchestra or a whole lot of, let's say you had a hundred guitarists, they're all going to play together. If you took one pitchfork and you just ding, and then you, and you tune each guitar to that same pitchfork, do you know what will happen? All the guitars will be in tune with each other because they were all tuned to the same standard. And our standard is Jesus. That's what we have to do. We just have to make sure that we are in tune with the true vine. We need to be like a sunflower. Have you ever gone past a field of sunflowers? They all just stare in the same direction. And as the sun moves, they move. And you know, what I actually discovered is that even after the sun sets, you know, they all like droop. Apparently, it's because they're still following the sun even though it's on the other side of the earth. Hey, I'm just, I'm just telling you what I read, okay? But we need to be like that sunflower. We just need to face... Jesus, all the time. If you want to have unity, and you know what Jesus said, what the Lord said to me, he said, you know, your role is just to grow. When Jesus said, I'm the true vine, just abide in me, that's what we have to do. Now, as I walked past those vineyards, I saw each plant just growing. All tuned to the same standard. And one of the things that I noticed as I got up early in the morning, like five o'clock, the sun was up there. Well, it wasn't up, but it was light. And as you peer out of, onto the vineyards, there's like all these groups of people walking past every plant, stopping, inspecting. And that's what God does. You know, some people say, God doesn't care about me. Let me tell you, God cares. He, Jesus said, my father is the vine dresser. And the job of the vine dresser was to go and look at every plant. And, and so early in the morning there would be an inspection. And they'd walk past every plant. Oh, this one's growing a bit skew. Clip a little bit off there. Prune a little bit here. Straighten this one. God loves you. You're important. And there's a lot of people, I can just imagine, I'm almost like God getting the angels are there and God and everybody's having this chit chat about us and how, they can, how God cares for us. We each have a role within our family and within the church, but our, our job is just to grow like a sunflower facing the sun. You know, when we were away, my daughter was at home, and she had to then feed the dogs, walk the dogs, look after the house, all this kind of stuff. The day before we came back, I saw her Facebook status, and she's, her Facebook status said, no more credit card, no more petrol card, no more house parties, goodbye to all this fun. Hello, free washing. Hello, massages. My parents are finally coming back from their gap year. <laughs> and I thought, that's cute. We all have our roles. And for a, moment, for a while there, Sean was just doing the role that Lynn normally does, except she t keeps telling me that she was on such a budget. She said, I lived as a pauper. Why didn't you put more money in the credit card? But anyway... 
I want to show you a picture now, which, there you can see it. It was a picture that I took just right next to our villa. And I noticed that a lot of the vineyards had roses growing by the vineyards. And I was fascinated by that. I thought, wow, I mean, that's nice. These guys really care a lot. They just want to look, these vineyards to look pretty, so they plant roses all over the show. And then I discovered that's not why the roses are there. Do you know that um, a rose is there because it's far more susceptible to disease than the vine. And so when they plant the roses there, if they look at the rose, if the rose gets sick, they know the vine's going to get sick next. And so it's an early warning system, if you like. And these roses were not just there to look beautiful. It was like an early warning system. And you know, the Lord said, he said, you know what, I've given you a rose. It's a Holy Spirit. One of the first signs of us losing our unity with God is the Holy Spirit starts to, he starts to go missing. He feels like we're missing. And God said, I will never leave you, but it's just our perception. You know in your life when you suddenly feel, gee, I just don't feel God's presence anymore. Your rose is withered. The rose is started to die. Maybe the roses disappeared. We need to make sure that the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is real and tangible all the time. Do you feel the Holy Spirit in your life? Listen, we all, we all real here. There are times when you really are on fire for God and you just walk with the Spirit on a daily basis and you feel Him. There are other times when you kind of say, the Holy Spirit, who's He again? And sometimes we're in between. But that's a real, real good litmus test for how well you're growing in the vine. We must not quench the Spirit. Do you know, roses are also given as a sign of love. And God loves us, and that's why He gave us, he gave us His Spirit. Joe Olson wrote this on Facebook last night. She said, the problem, and this is a quote from Richard Maybury, who, who died very recently. The problem in the church is that we have replaced longing for God's presence with the curiosity about His presence. Curiosity about God's presence won't usher in His manifest presence. A longing and yearning, a craving for Him will. The church must recapture her zeal for Jesus and make Him her most magnificent obsession. Isn't that beautiful? That's what Richard Mabry said. The church must recapture her zeal for Jesus and make him her most magnificent obsession. And the ultimate expression of love was the cross. That's why I just love that picture because, you know, in that picture you can see the rose, the vine, and the cross. And that's where God expressed his love. And you know the, uh, you know the story how the, the Roman soldiers, they, they twisted thorns together. They plaited them together to form a crown of thorns, which they put on Jesus' head. And I was interested, in, uh, you know, sometimes you say, I wonder what kind of thorns those were. And there's all kinds of theories about what kind of thorns they were. Some of the theories are this kind of bush and that kind of bush. Some theories are they were rose thorns. I know that some people say they were longer. But for the moment, let's just imagine that they were rose thorns. And that was quite telling. Quite a, quite a moment to think that they would take the rose, which is that expression of love, and form those thorns into a crown and Jesus' head was filled with blood. And through that punishment that he took, he was able to give us a blessing. Because the oil that was 
You, you know, in Leviticus 8, when Moses consecrated the temple or the tabernacle and all those things, he just sprinkled, if you read in Leviticus 8, 8 11, I think, he sprinkled the tabernacle with oil. But when he got to Moses, to Aaron, his brother, who is now going to be the high priest, he poured the oil on his head. And it says, it says there in verse 2, it's like the precious oil running down on the beard, even onto the collar of his robes. That's the blessing that comes from unity. And Jesus took the thorns of the rose so that we could have the blessing or the fragrance of his blessing. And that's what God is like when he blesses us. He's generous. He is a good God. He's a gen- Sometimes people say, I wonder if God cares about me. You know, God doesn't seem to bless me very much. He gives me these tiny little blessings and sometimes there's no bless- Listen, let me tell you, God is a generous God. He blesses abundantly. He blesses abundantly. Sometimes we're looking in the wrong place for our blessings. Sometimes we, have, we actually have far more blessings than we realize. Just being able to walk, being healthy, being able to hear. You know, it's when you see somebody who is blind and they're carrying, they're being led by a dog and you say, oh, thank you God that I have my sight. Thank you God for my family, my children, for a wife, for whatever it is, we are so blessed. And sometimes we think, but my bank account isn't very good. I'm not very blessed. We are so blessed. We have a generous God. You know, the blessing, the priestly blessing from Deuteronomy 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. This is what, this is what Aaron was told to, to pray over the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Isn't that beautiful? And you know that when we are in unity, the blessing flows towards one another. Sometimes we have disagreements. And we know this church has been through a tricky time. It's been through a tough time. We've had disagreements. We've seen things differently. We have not necessarily agreed with it. We've criticized one another. We've done much of that. Who's right? Who's, you know... Unity, when we are like the sunflower that just grows, making sure we stay in the warmth of the light of the Son of God, that unity will have a positive outflow from us. Not just to one another in the church, but to people coming in. You know, I know that last year we heard it, it said many times, this house will be a beacon of light in Camps Bay. It will be like a place where people can come. You know, that won't happen until we have unity. And, and so you say, but how can I bring about unity? Well, the good thing is that you can't. Mike and Julie can't bring about unity. The elders and the leaders can't bring about unity. Your job, your role, is to make sure that you just grow, remain, abide in the vine. Because as I went past and I walked past those vineyards and I just looked off plant after plant after plant, they all looked really healthy. And if you want to have healthy relationships, make sure you are healthy. Make sure that your rose has not withered and died, that you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. You have not quenched His presence through our selfishness, through our own ambitions. It's not our job. God will make the unity happen. And as you look at those vineyards, you see every single plant just growing beautifully. And the, and the people come in the morning and through the day, they're just inspecting and they're making sure everything goes well. God will look after us. We can do many things to make sure we don't get out of unity. And so the word says that we should be careful not to gossip, not to speak badly, not to judge one another. All of those things 
Those are things that we can do. And that will also help alleviate the stresses and stress. Because that just adds, you know what that does? It just adds to the cloud. All of those things that we do, they just add to the cloud that gets in the way of the warmth of God. And so there's much we can do to disrupt the unity. But bringing unity is just God's. That's the result of each person just being where he needs to be. And so my message to you this morning is really just that you would look at your own life and you say, you know what? I want to make sure that that rose is fragrant in my life. That the Holy Spirit's presence is felt, that I connect with God, that I feel God speaking to me on a daily basis, that the first sign of, where's, where's God's presence gone? It's a warning sign. You need to get back to that place where you can feel the presence of God. If you feel it slipping away, take some action. Do something. And then just abide in the vine. God will grow you. And you know what? God will grow this church. And we just need to submit to Him. And we need to allow Him to do it. We need to refrain from adding to the cloud. And the warmth of God will always win through, I believe. Unity and personal peace is only found when our hearts and minds are set on Jesus. When we live like a sunflower, always turning towards God to get the full impact of the warmth of His Son, allowing for our Father to care for us. Amen. Ice cream on. Okay. Okay, that was good. Why don't we just stand? We're going to sing together our final song. And uh, after the singing, if you want to get some prayer, just come and stand at the front here.